Discover America. And Cortez was the god of death indeed. Well, now, Zorro and Balboa like to show their shiny armor and they all killed our people in the name of gold and greed. Jesus didn't have nothing to do with it now. They took him along just to justify the plan. Well, now, all of us here left with our own invocation. We shall not be removed here from Sugar Land. Listen to me, Sugar Land. We got the gold. The gold ain't for sale and it can't be stolen. Sugar Land, lies have been told. Body's been sold, but we keep on rolling, rolling. Sugar, Sugar Land, y'all. Oh, hey, raising up. Cain and sugar land. People of the world, don't you know we came from Africa? We went across the world, became all of humankind. We built the pyramids and the very first universities long before a colonizer lost his mind. Fast folk, fast times of fast food. Corporate plantations, mass production, bad moves. Oh, infidel people been reduced to servitude, but they cannot take our gold or our fortitude. Sugar land. We got the gold, the gold ain't for sale and it can't be stolen. Sugar land, lies have been told, body's been sold, but we keep on rolling, yeah. Rolling, 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 yeah, yeah. I've been the sense of light on Thursday, yeah, yeah. With Glenn, Siobhan, VJ, David, and me. Thank you so much, Gabby. Thank you so much. Uh, Presenza New York is very pleased to welcome um, our guest and uh, welcome the public online. And thanks everyone who helped to make this uh, discussion possible. What will it take for Black Lives to really matter? Everyone is uh, recognizing the current moment as a unique opportunity for African Americans to uncover the structural discrimination that has been embedded in U.S. society. The disproportion of black uh, afflicted by the pandemic and the killing by the police of George Floyd were significant events that produced an uprising in many cities all over the world. What is about the U.S. that has made it difficult to transform or even address its underlying racism, discrimination, and hatred against black, brown, and indigenous people. As a humanist, we have 12 guided principles and one correspond at this moment. You will make your conflict disappear when you understand them in their ultimate roots, not when you want to resolve them. So we want to understand and look at the different type of violences against African-American and people of colors. At the economical level, where discrimination block access to capital in an all capital society, with religious institutions which accept and promote public discrimination, with a justice system that blandly acquits crime by the police and disproportionately incarcerated mem member of the black and brown community for non-violent crimes. Within the police department that have targeted, harassed and killed people from community of colors. Within city and town that have lowered their threshold for public health and pollution and or manipulate report concerning water, air pollution and lead poisoning in poor neighborhoods. And with our public education system, which has implemented reforms that are creating the largest school segregation in the past 50 years. 
So this discussion today will have two moments. One, we're going to see, we're going to cover the past, and each guest will have uh, five minutes, and will be followed by the Q&A, um, who uh, moderated by Gabriel Calendar. And then we will go to the second part, with uh, where we will look at the present and future of uh, of this issue. And I'm going to speak, and I'm going to ask Glenn Ford to to start and to give us a, an overview of the process of uh, how did he got involved with the African American community and fight uh, with uh, along the Black Panther Party created. A Black Agenda report got involved with media, and and this main focus is always to work on analysis about the discrimination. Glenn, welcome to the show, and please uh, give us your uh, your insight. Well, I mean that's that's a uh, <laughs> that's a large order that you just asked me for, but I know I, I'm a, a red what's called a red diaper baby. That means that uh, my parents met in in the Communist Party. Uh, my father uh, was the first black man to have a television show in the Deep South in 1958. Uh, that is a non-gospel television show. It was called Rockin' with the Deuce. It was a, a dance uh, type show. Uh, I uh, was involved, uh, therefore, with, with radio. He was a radio announcer. And when I got out of the army in 1970, uh, after a three years uh, in the U.S. Army, uh, I got a job in radio as a news person. Uh, I didn't want to be a I didn't want to be a news person because I wanted to be a disc jockey like like my father because that's where the money and the women were. Uh, but they insisted that I do news, and I was quite unhappy at my first job in Augusta, Georgia, uh, un until I did a deep uh, uh, penetration uh, of Augusta's black community. Augusta was a backwater that had not been touched uh, by the civil rights movement. Uh, many folks don't know it, but Martin Luther King couldn't go uh, or set up headquarters in most uh, towns, even in his own state of Georgia, because other Baptist ministers uh, would not open up their congregations. And Baptist ministers did not go into town unless they were invited. And Augusta was one of those towns he was not invited in. Uh, so when I went uh, to Augusta to work for James Brown's radio station there, I tore down a list of all the important black folks that they had told me to contact regarding any uh, any developments, uh, contact for, uh, for interviews, because I saw that it was all preachers. It was Reverend this and Bishop that and the right reverend this, and I decided I wasn't going to give a further mouthpiece uh, for accommodationist yes. ministries. To the right that. community and identified uh, 10 people uh, who were actually uh, the real leaders of the community. I went into the housing projects and I uh, found a person who I knew was there, a rather large and loud black woman who spoke for the tenants. And uh, she became my contact person uh, on not just housing issues, but issues of poverty. And I knew that there was a brother in uh, Augusta who uh, jumped up every time the police beat another brother down. I found him easily, and he became my person uh, on criminal justice. And I knew that there was always a black businessman who was complaining about the county and the city never giving black people contracts. So I made that person uh, my contact for economic development. And then similarly, people in education and every conceivable uh, uh, area of news interest and just repopulated the airwaves uh, with this real black leadership in Augusta, Georgia. And almost immediately, uh, because they were now on radio, these natural leaders who were known to their neighbors and in their neighborhood become, became the leaders of Augusta. And I realized that through this control of the microphone, uh, I could actually change, change the political complexion of the black community in a medium-sized city. So I wasn't 
I wasn't sad anymore by being uh, a radio journalist and so poorly paid. So can you tell us the difficulties you um, like the, the Black Panther face in, in the development and how the, the state uh, got involved to more or less to, I mean, it happened the same thing with Acorn to destroy it. I didn't quite understand the question. No, like then each time the African-American tried to set up, or organize something like Acorn who had half million people in 1200 neighborhood, uh the, the the quickly the state get involved to to break to break that uh, that organization and and it happen all over history uh each time the the african american community gets get uh, uh organized it get very complicated well let's put look at it this way in 1970 uh i was able uh to put all of these uh, local black leaders on the air and uh, create the circumstances in which uh, grassroots community organizations uh, in uh, Augusta uh, would for the first time uh, have their voices heard every day uh, by the whole community and therefore grow in terms of their size and also the scope of their mission. The reason we were able to do that uh, is because we still uh, had uh, at that time in 1970 uh, at least the residue of a mighty movement uh, that had grown in the 1960s and the people uh, still felt uh, empowered. Uh, they, there was the momentum of that movement uh, was still there and it gave a real freedom uh, not just to me but to hundreds of other uh, young black broadcasters uh, across across the country but the 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 regime's reaction to that movement uh, was quite different uh, in in response to the movements of of the 60s uh, the black power movement the rebellions the formation of the black panther party uh, the republican and democratic parties uh, in a bipartisan uh, action uh, began imposed uh, what we now call the mass black incarceration state, beginning with these draconian drug laws, laws, uh, laws. Uh, but this mass black incarceration state's mission was to criminalize the entirety of the black community, uh, to to vastly uh, increase the manpower and firepower of the police, and to uh, adjust uh, the legal regime in the United States uh, to that of a police state uh, to ensure that there would never be a repeat of the 60s. And they put, of course, they put the Black Panther Party on the list uh, as the number one uh, danger, domestic danger to national security in the United United States. Uh, today, what, we're, what we see uh, is a mass movement and we've been observing it and participating in it for the yes, last. We're going to talk about about. We're going to talk about the present in in the next in few minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So um, welcome, Shivana, and uh, I wanted to 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 see with Shivana uh, Rene Newsom. Um, how did you got involved? What is your experience as a youth uh, living in the Bronx, and then how you got involved with? Uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter, how did you create the Black Lives Matter in New York, and and how did you end up running for Congress? Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. My my apologies for just getting oh, in. It's just so much happening right now in social justice. Um, I guess some people would say that it, it's in my blood. My parents met at a rally in 69 here in the Bronx. They were fighting for black history to be taught by black teachers. So my dad was outside looking all cool. My mom was still in the window and he screamed to her to come downstairs and join everyone in the protest. And high school sweethearts got married, raised me and my brother in the Bronx. Um, growing up in the Bronx, the relationship with police is not that of such of my, my friends who grew up in the suburbs. I don't have many fond memories of the police. 
Um, I remember the first time, my first police encounter that sticks out in my mind, I was roughly about six or seven years old. My grandmother had sent us, me and my brother, who was probably about 13 or 14, sent us home with groceries. Uh, she had done a lot of grocery shopping. She wanted to send her grandkids all their snacks and the things they wanted. And officers were in the back seat of a cab, um, about a 15 minute cab ride from my grandmother's to my home. And they pulled us over right in front of Cedric Projects. For anyone who knows history, uh, the year I was born in 1984, Eleanor Bunker was shot and murdered by the NYPD at that very spot. So here I am six years later after the death of Eleanor Bunker, and they patted my pockets, a six-year-old little girl, uh, went through our bags, and that's my first image of New York City's police department. Uh, growing up, stopping frisk was always something ever present on every corner and every block because we do com we do congregate in our communities the same way people in the suburbs do on their porches. We hang out on our street. We hang out by our local bodegas. So it's constantly you people live in fear of the police department. They're overly aggressive and they do brutalize people in my community. So that's my experience. Um, as they'll know, I, I'm, an active, I'm an activist and I'm a very vocal advocate against uh, their, their practices. So moving forward a couple years, because I, I know the show's only running for about an hour, so I'll speed it up. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll speed it up. I'll <laughs> take a little bit of time. I'll, 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 I'll give you guys the condensed version of it all. I worked on a campaign with a bunch of fellow activists. We, we had no name for it. I'd been going to protests and stuff since Sean Bell, and of course, the world remembers Trayvon Martin. Uh -huh. And we had started a campaign called "I Ain't Voting Until Black Lives Matter." Now, the reason behind that campaign was the Democratic and the Republican Party clearly were not addressing the needs of my community. They never meet my community with real policy agenda. They come to churches and they, they sing in the choir and they kiss our babies. But as you see with other marginalized groups, there, there's never any policy. So off the heels of that, we protested the Republican National Con Convention and the Democratic as well. My brother and I were at my mother's kitchen table and we're like, hey, there is a Black Lives Matter in New York here, but it's not radical. It's not revolutionary. It's not the change that our peoples need. It's not confronting brutality and the other injustices that we face head on. So that's where the birth of Black Lives Matter Greater New York came from. It was a brother and a sister at a table, um, a kitchen dining table, and we just knew that more could be done and we had the power to do so. I was actually a financial advisor at the time and my brother holds um, a Juris Doctorate, but we felt our community needed us. We needed people with strategy who were unapologetic and unafraid to say these things. So the work's continued and we've been there for the LGBT community. We've gone against uh, the NYPD. We played a huge part in the firing of Officer Daniel Pantaleo. That victory was bittersweet because that man should be behind bars as the murderer he truly is. Um, in terms of women's reproductive rights, black women's maternal health. And these are the things that I want people to know about Black Lives Matter, Greater New York and our principles. We stand for the full liberation of black people. So that covers environmental injustice, housing injustice, police reform, addressing mass incarceration, criminal justice reform, all these things. Now we also developed something called Black Lives Caucus. Now Black Lives Caucus is our political arm where we have endorsed candidates who call themselves progressive. But as we've seen, once people were elected to office, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah who was it? once people got a, a elected, they didn't want to be anti-cop. Um, you could only get a tweet out of them. They wanted to do things to help them remain in power. And it yeah. no longer became the campaign stump speeches that they gave. And that's why I ran for Congress, because yeah. we need an unapologetic black yeah. voice. We need yeah. someone who's unafraid. To, to say these things and actually have the power to write laws because nothing happens for people who look like me unless there's legislation behind it. So so that's my life in like a four minute nutshell. No, thank you so much. It's great. You, the timing is perfect. Uh, Vijay, we, um, we published an article um, you wrote about to tear down the racism statues and racism debt and pay the equalizing reparation. And we illustrate the economic disparity between uh, the, the white and the black. 
and explains the craziness of the theory of compensation at the end of slavery. So can you can you frame, can you quickly give us a, a, a really an illustration of what is the situation of African American at the economic level in, in, in the US? Because I don't think uh, too many people understand the gap uh, enormous for for the community. If you don't mind, David, because I, I never answer questions, I'm going to say something else. Uh, <laughs> the first thing I would like to say, just to put it in context with um, Glenn and Shimona, is that I was born and brought up in Calcutta in India. And I was deeply moved by the Soweto uprising in 1976, when school children like myself were killed by the apartheid South African state. Uh, this was a very monumental event in 1976. Um, it uh, marked me and I involved myself as quickly as I could in the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, you know, this uh, movement for black lives or the current uprising after the disgusting murder of, um, you know, in Minneapolis, uh, it's, it's this ridiculously punctual uh, events that take place where people are brutally killed in public in the United States. This has impacted not only uh, people in the United States, but outside. You know, one has seen in Great Britain um, the attack on the statues, Edward Colson, the statue thrown into the River Avon in Brighton. You know, a man who had the um, ill thought of having people, human beings as property. Um, this raises a very important question for us. It's one thing to throw statues down. It's one thing to uh, rename buildings and so on. But there's a deeper question which is not being asked, I think, forcefully enough. You know, after the Haitian people so bravely fought off the French um, in the 19th, early 19th century, so bravely created, in a sense, the first people's revolution in world history, um, the French forced the people of Haiti, the new Republic of Haiti, to pay an indemnity. In other words, the Haitians had to pay the French for liberating themselves from this ridiculous, disgusting system of enslavement. And till the 1940s, the Haitians paid the French 90 million French francs. You know, just imagine that. The Haitian people paid the French for liberating themselves. The island of Jamaica, the Jamaican people fought the British, you know, with the Morant Bay Rebellion and this, that and the other, fought the British and won their freedom from Britain. You know, when the abolition of human enslavement took place in Britain, the British people, the British Parliament started to pay off Jamaican white owners of human beings, plantation owners, they started to pay them off. And until recently, until the 2000s, they paid them off about 17 billion pounds. In other words, when it comes to talk of reparation for enslavement, for the destruction of people's lives over generations, then you are told, oh, sorry, we can't talk about reparations for the people of not only the United States, Jamaica, Haiti, South Africa, you know, where my radicalization begins in the ashes of Soweto. You can't talk about reparations, we are told, because that happened in the past. You know, people will say it was not me, it was some ancestor, not even my ancestor. So you can't talk about reparations to those who had been enslaved in this disgusting system. But you can give reparations to the people who enslaved them. In other words, the Citizens of France received reparations to the tune of 90 million French francs and the former plantation owners, those who owned human beings in Jamaica were paid until just 10, 15 years ago, they were paid reparations. So I think the question of getting rid of statues, the question of renaming streets, these things are very important. You know, this is a kind of cultural politics that we certainly need now and more of, but you have to also ask the economic question. You know, the history of Jim Crow before that, the history of human enslavement produced an unequal world which had racial impacts, deep impacts along lines of, you know, what is known as race, deep impacts. And there's never been an attempt to redress those impacts. 
So look at what happens now. Now you have a person who is supposed alleged to have given a counterfeit $20 bill. Why? Because of the racial class gap in the United States. A man in New York City is suffocated because he's alleged to have sold single cigarettes. Why? Why was he alleged to have sold single cigarettes? Why would he be doing that? Because of the racialized class gap. So the discussion always becomes, you know, merely about police brutality. Police brutality is a very real and terrible thing, but it's a symptom of a much greater problem, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is a racialized class gap yeah. for which there seems to be no agenda to, to, for redressal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to going to give the the, the room to. Uh, to Gabriela and, uh, and and the questions then people have submitted. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, mesh my question in with Tej Grewal, uh, who says, "Can you discuss the state of international solidarity and fight for human rights against imperialism and colonialism in support of the global black family?" And so, VJ, I'm going to first pose this to you. You know, Palestine. The Congo, New Orleans, Bed Stuy, India, the Sudan, and on and on and on we go. What's the common struggle? And also, what is, I want to just put these two together, what do you say are the impacts of Brahmanism on the Dalits? How do we, um, how do we, how does our struggle correspond? What's the impact of the caste system on capitalism? Firstly, I would just like to say that all forms of supremacy should be treated as anachronistic. You know, whether it's racism or the wretchedness of the caste system or indeed misogyny. I mean, all forms of supremacy, male supremacy, the supremacy of, of various people who believe they are socially superior, this has to be, you know, unilaterally condemned. But let's also be a little frank. Globally, the left is extremely weak. And it's the left that has an authentic position against supremacy. You know, liberals, for instance, they fiddle around with supremacy. They would like to have a statue removed, but pardon? The left white is very light. I, I will say the left white, it's really um, good. Yeah, no, I, I'm just trying to su suggest that, you know, the global left is weak. And for instance, at an earlier period, uh, we would have seen at the United Nations a stronger condemnation of Israel's illegal attempt to annex Palestine, uh, you know, slated for July the 1st yesterday. We would have seen a much stronger position at the UN, but you don't see it. You know, mm -hmm. we should, in, in the 1940s, important leaders and intellectuals of the black community moved the United Nations with a statement called We Charge Genocide perhaps the most important document that has come out of the American uh, liberation struggle. That document was taken into the United Nations. I can tell you today, if Shivana and Glenn Ford and others produced a We Charge a Genocide document, I'm not sure who in the UN would take that document seriously. And that's because the left is extraordinarily weak on the global stage. We have to increase the strength of the left. Otherwise, we won't be able to advance a politics you know, that's against the um, the, the, the kind of uh, sedimentation of, su of supremacy, you know, to knock supremacy, not just statues, but to knock supremacy off its pedestal. You need a very strong people's movement globally. Mm -hmm. so, can, Thank you for that. Can, can yes, Glenn. One yeah. more question. And, oh, Glenn, go ahead. Go ahead yes, I, I wanted to add that a, a couple of years ago, uh, I was in Geneva at the uh, United Nations palaces there uh, for a session of their human rights organization. And some young activists from Chicago uh, did present a petition. Uh, we charge genocide patterned after uh, the one presented by Paul Robeson and others uh, in the, uh, you know, around 19, 1950. So there is an internationalist uh, consciousness present uh, in uh, this young black movement but not enough of it, and it's and and we need much more of it. Uh, as black folks, uh, we benefited tremendously uh, from international support and from the very 
presence of decolonization movements uh, in the 1950s uh, and into the 60s because the United States uh, trying you know, desperate to um, uh, continue its in, imperial uh, control over these newly independent colonies and wanted to impress the world that it was getting rid of its own apartheid system. And then this, so this became a, a great weapon uh, for us. Uh, but, and oh, and in this latest, uh, in these latest uh, protests around George Floyd, we've seen wonderful responses from all over the world with demonstrations in solidarity. But we need to be doing more of that. There needs to be more of a, that is, uh, the diaspora at least, and oppressed peoples all over the world have to get uh, take a higher uh, uh, priority in, in our movement's uh, uh, agenda. Uh, for example, six million Congolese have died mm -hmm. since yes. 1996 under Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama, and this slaughter continues under mm -hmm. Trump. Uh, and yet virtually nobody in the country talks about it. This is the biggest genocide since World War II. Yeah. And people have the words Darfur on their lips, a much smaller loss of life, but, but nobody talks about the Congo. Mm -hmm. Glenn, I want to I want to just interrupt you there because I know we have to move on, but I want to speak to that and say thank you so much and thank you for mentioning the Congo. The Friends of the Congo, I know, for example, Kambali Musavuli speaks very fervently about what's been going on in the Congo and shares your same um, your your same feelings around it. Like, why isn't there such an uprising about it? What's going on that more people aren't talking about it? I want to direct this next question to Shavona. Shavona, um, I was born in 1965. I was given up by my mother's family because my father is black. I moved into an adopted family um, in about 1967 in a black community on the border between St. Albans and Hollis, Queens. My adopted father was born in 1920, my mother 1922. His people were from Barbados. My mother's family was on the census listed as mulattoes. My father hated white people. Coming back from World War II, having to sit in the back of the train, he had, it impacted his life. It left a mark on him. Like how VJ said, Soweto left a mark on him. It left a mark on him. What, let me just say this first. I never presume and wouldn't want anyone to presume that any of the circumstances that I've grown up in is what makes me black. In fact, it's the way that white people perceive my blackness, right? Um, that they'll put it on the circumstances. What is it to be black in America? And I ask them to see, black people know what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Puerto Rican folks, they'll be like, well, you're not black, you're poor, you're not, or, or Italian folks, or what are you? Can you just, for the audience, what is it to be black in America? A constant state of struggle. To know that oppression is at your doorstep every day. To know that the very melanin and color of my skin has created an obstacle is an obstacle, is a barrier, that I could lose my life because of the shade of my complexion, that I only get paid 63 cents on the dollar if I chose to go back to corporate America, to go into a room and people think that my assistant is my boss, uh, to be denied my basic human rights. To be a black person in America is to be considered less than human. And I think that that's why the death of George Floyd is so important and he will live on in time as a martyr because it's the first time that the world in America saw a black man as a human being. We have been dehumanized. So that's what it's like. It's a constant struggle. It's a constant fight for oppression. You think about systemic oppression. You think about redlining. You think about everything in this country has been created over the last 400 years since the transatlantic slave trade to stop you. So that's what it's like to be black in America. So, Thank you. so Shivana, let me let me continue and go. We're going to go to the next to the segment. It's so. What is the situation now 
and and what's what's happening now and what should and uh, need to happen in the future to uh, not just uh, change the police or not just uh, change the justice system or not just change the education but having stopping this discrimination what what it will take for you and because you run for congress and you are really politically involved what it will take to to really transform this discrimination um quite frankly i i just want equity and the liberation of black people i want us to stop being oppressed and to stop being murdered in the street we will never change racism i cannot nothing i do or say or no matter how powerful a speech i may give will stop the racism that lies in the hearts of people here but i want to level the playing field i, yeah. I do want to fund education it should be fully funded uh it's no reason why in new york city that district two on the upper west side has too many books in the school system i went to district nine has none it these things just don't these they actually they do make sense the way the system is it's not broken it was designed to be that way and mm -hmm. i am an optimistic woman and i believe that we can redesign that system so i don't need for white people in red me i just don't need for them to hinder and stop the access to my people's growth yeah, yeah. glenn in, in the same in the same how do you see the present moment do you see things are changing or it, it it's it's an uprising <laughs> who's gonna yeah. who's, how well, this, you know this. And let me just let me just piggyback on that real quick david sorry as we're talking about things are changing i wanted to ask you glenn for all of the folks out there all of the black folks and brown folks in the corporate sector who would love to have this system dismantled but are using it to pay their bills and now have to deal with their bosses who are hiring diversity and inclusion firms just so they can posture and look good What's the opportunity for them in this moment? Well, you know, uh, I'm somewhat cynical uh, about this. Uh, I think people should, uh, at this moment, if uh, corporate people are, are trying to reposition the perception that people have of them, I'd yeah. milk them for all they have uh, and give them yeah. nothing in return. Uh, <laughs> and, so we don't know if that 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 guilt moment will come again. Uh, <laughs> and, and some other backlash uh, will be uh, be the answer. You know, but speaking, you know, in terms of black in America, to expound on on your previous question, uh, black folks got to be a people here uh, because of the system that we lived in. And so we have to uh, correctly identify uh, that system, and it's not just capitalism; it is the white settler state, this country, this colony, and then a state was conceived of as a white settler colony mm -hmm. for white people. Uh, mm -hmm. when, when Judge Taney in the Supreme Court uh, interpreted the Constitution against Dred Scott and said that a uh, black man has no rights that a uh, white man has, uh, is, is bound to respect in the United States, he was speaking uh, and, he is, and he said that that is clearly the view of the Founding Fathers. Uh, he was correct mm -hmm. in terms of that being the view of the Founding Fathers. We know because of what they uh, created in addition to what they said. So what we are still fighting is that white settler state. And when we fight imperialism, we are fighting against the prerogatives that the white settler state was formed to pursue. It was created uh, as a nascent empire. And Thomas Jefferson actually called it that. And the whole ambition was to expand, expanding meaning euphemism for killing every indigenous person you find along the way. And mm -hmm. then killing a half of Mexico and fueling uh, the economy uh, that, that would uh, uh, spread in this expansion through slave labor. And mm -hmm. in 1850, the value of slaves in the United States was greater than any other asset of the country, all its railroads and industries, etc. everything but the land itself. And in fact, the land in the slave states was only valuable because there were slaves to uh, work the land. And so, mm -hmm. so we, we're not just talking about 
about Confederates when we, when we see these monuments coming down. We're talking about all the monuments to the white settler state. And that includes Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who was not just a racist, but the first industrial scale uh, US imperialist uh, who stole Puerto Rico and stole the Philippines and uh, basically and stole Panama to put the canal on it. And mm -hmm. that's the behavior of a white settler state. So if you're anti-war and if you're anti-racist, you have to realize that what you're confronting uh, is the white settler state uh, grown big and ugly. Mm -hmm. and here, Vijay, what it will take at the economical level to, to transform this, what just Glenn described, this, this structuration uh, to be able to give access to economical fairness, uh, capital and uh, distribution? I know with, uh, with uh, Shivona, we, we work on, uh, on, um, on universal basic income as a way to distribute uh, incomes to everyone, regardless of any type of discrimination or any type of filters than the system can imagine. So how do you, how do you see from today to, to tomorrow, what structure can be transformed so we can go to a, a more just and fairness uh, equilibrium? On the global level, oh, sorry, Glenn? No, that's no, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll on, the, on the global level, it's uh, two numbers that people need to keep in mind. Um, the first number is that the external debt of developing countries, by the way, this includes every single country on the continent of Africa, uh, external debt of developing countries at present is 11.9 or 11.8 trillion dollars. Um, this year itself, debt servicing payments will be about 3.9 trillion. This debt has to be immediately cancelled. There's no question of suspension or postponement or anything. This debt has to be cancelled. And I think it's incumbent upon people around the world, movements around the world, including in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Europe and so on, to be fighting to cancel this debt. That's the first thing. If you don't cancel this debt, for instance, as the president of Ethiopia put it, they will not be able to move an agenda for their people at all. Because yeah. in this coronavirus recession, they are yeah. just slipping back into another era. That's the yeah. first number, 11 trillion. I'm going to give you a second number. $32 trillion is sitting in tax havens around the world. Most of that money is white monopoly capital money squiddled away into these hidden tax havens. Three times the amount of the external debt of the developing countries are sitting in tax havens. Do you know what we should demand? We should demand that those $32 trillion be brought back into circulation as, as financing for development and that $11 trillion debt overhang over much of the planet be immediately sliced. These are the two numbers. I want people to digest them. $11 trillion to be cancelled and $32 trillion brought back into mm. socially productive activity to lift people out of the miserable situation in which they live now. Uh, Shivana, do you have something to add to, to this? How, how do you see the, the, at the economy, very specifically at the economical level? Because I don't think we are looking uh, strongly enough to this issue. Yeah. Shivana, yeah. Uh, I am um, as we both worked on of universal basic income that will assist in the immediate needs. But going back to the earlier conversation, we need reparations here. And not only does America owe us, but when you look at black people's wealth in this country, it's negative wealth. We have nothing. Sometimes it's 9,000, sometimes it's zero or negative. People who have endured and built the railroads, as Glenn had talked about, built the White House and every single thing. You can't keep telling people, oh, black people, go get an education. Oh, black people, don't be lazy. Don't commit crime. And asking people to pull themselves up by the bootstraps when they have no boots. It's enough money. The same way, remember the income movement uh, letter that we worked on before the first stimulus packet, how everyone thought we were out of our minds talking about universal basic income. 
but America found the stimulus money. The same way that BJ is talking about tax havens, America, this country, what I can speak for where I'm born and raised and we're still living in, we have enough money to pay reparations. I believe Robert Johnson came up with a number of 14 trillion that would cover reparations. I'm not sure how great that number is, but I'm sick of talking about it. We need to end it. Like how much longer should black people suffer in this country when America clearly has trillions of dollars to spend on wars, we had trillions to give a bailout to banks. We have the money. We need to end the wealth disparity and give people a hand up. It's nothing wrong with giving back to the same people that this country was built upon. I think it's, it's important go, go, go that, this, that this second wave uh, of movement uh, activity uh, uh, results in community control of the police. It, we're not talking here uh, about asking for a bigger menu of reforms like what the Democratic Party laid out. All of those reforms, of course, uh, would be better, but they don't solve the problem. The problem is that police are not accountable to the community. The problem is the police mission is diametrically opposed to the interests of the community. The solution is to empower the community so that the community can decide how its security needs will be met. Uh, and in fact, it should be expanded, not just community control of the police, but community control of the social services that folks in the di uh, um, uh, divest from police uh, movement say should be doing lots of the jobs, uh, lots of the functions that the police now mishandle. Well, those social services should also be accountable to the community. Many of them, as every social worker knows, are actually hostile to their clients. So we need con community control there. And of mm -hmm. course, we've always needed community control of the schools. And I think that there is a different mood and dynamic out there uh, now in terms of community control of the schools than existed back in the 60s when we had the Ocean Hill Brownsville confrontation. So, so community empowerment, people's empowerment ought to be the end result of this second wave. Uh, hmm. Accept any reforms know, any know, that, but, that, that they know. give. But I, I would love to jump in on that. And yeah. I would encourage all of you to read the Black Act because this is what we do want. We understand that the current government is pacifying us with these current legislations. We understand it. And we do need to get to community control. And we have seen the success in other communities where they control their community. When you look at the Jewish community, how they have their own ambulances, they have their own police, they they police themselves, and they take care of their own. This is what we need to get back to, Glenn. And this, I can speak for our organization, Black Lives Matter Creative New York, this is what we absolutely want. We want control of our own community. And I'm sure it's going to shoot me in the foot for what I'm about to say. But if you look at when we controlled our own communities, when we look at segregation, when we look at having money spent in our community, right now the black dollar only lasts for about six hours within our community. You see how black businesses were thriving. You see the black family being together. So I'm in total agreement with you. And from my side, with everything that you just discussed and said, that's what we're working towards in this new wave of movement. Okay. We, yeah. Chibana, but with the coronavirus, 40% of the African-American business went under, okay? So this money is gone, and you went to Amazon. And the neighborhood and the social fabric around these businesses, these small businesses in our neighborhood, in your neighborhood, when yeah. it's gone. So it's not just, I agree with organizing, and I, I work on voting rights for 10 years, and I know 50% of the people in some neighborhood have no right to vote. In the Bronx, people lost their right to vote because they were incarcerated. So the representation of African American is much lower than it should be. And it's always a problem. And I'm not I'm not mm -hmm. census counting and I'm not I'm not talking about all of that. Yeah. So it's 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 like asking the people who have been discriminated to save themselves. And we are not asking the people who are discriminated to do something. So how well, what, what I hear, what I hear on top of that, and just to add in, right? I I can hear from um, 
some of the older folks that I speak with, even the education levels were much better under segregation. Right? So as we started to integrate, we started to see a decline in our levels of education and even how we interacted with our, amongst ourselves. So there is something too, like Dr. John Henry Clark said, let's take back, let's own our own banks. I know Glenn, you talked about nationalizing the bank and I can hear you on that, but having our own economic system our own educational system, because inside of the system that we are already in, there are too many obstacles. The moment now is to simply get out of our way and give us our due. It's kind of like that. I want to move on to another question. Can, can, I, can I just say something about that, please? Uh, yeah. If you don't mind. I mean, yeah. uh, I'm not. I'm not going to. Uh, I don't want to start a debate with you on this, but I just <laughs> like to say that. It's a very difficult thing. You can't start your own bank because the world financial system is so deeply integrated. I mean, look at Venezuela today. Venezuela is being suffocated by the U.S. Treasury Department's unilateral yeah. illegal sanctions. You know, Absolutely. that's what the U.S. Treasury Department is doing. If you had black banks, they would be suffocated exactly. by the banking system that's global. So in a sense, the, the path to liberation Black liberation's road has always been through full human emancipation. There yeah. is no other way. I mean, yeah, yeah. there is no other way to liberate ourselves unless we liberate ourselves from the chains of imperialism, capitalism, this disgusting racist system that has entrenched itself in the hearts and minds of people. We have to always strive for full liberation. I think there's a temptation to say, let's turn inward and take care of ourselves but they will suffocate you even more. The I can't breathe slogan is so appropriate for the way in which, you know, banking systems and so on have suffocated countries, not allowed them to breathe. And what we are seeing has been done to Cuba over seven decades, what is being done now to Venezuela and what they did to Zimbabwe, you know, for decades was to suffocate these countries. We just can't do it unless we fight for full human liberation globally. But what what does this? I mean, I, it's it just maybe to close because we can go on for for a long time. Do you have any question? Can you check for the questions? But what yes, we have one question in from Jeremiah. How can we go about building strong global institutions like the UN, but with actual power to solve these issues? It kind of speaks to a little bit about what we're saying, and that anyone could take that. I know Glenn, you wanted to say something. If you want to integrate in what you were going to say and address, that'd be great. Well, I don't. I don't know if it's integratable. Uh, I <laughs> wanted. I wanted to uh, continue what the sister was talking about in, in terms of community development. That also is people power. Uh, that also should be uh, fund community development banks uh, funded by uh, the government, but administered by the community. Uh, and and when I say community, I'm not talking about appointees. I'm talking about the same kind of elected structures. This means that activists really have to work hard. <laughs> elected structures. We work hard. We work hard. <laughs> that, that, that people that folks are proposing for community control of the police in Chicago, which has the most developed community control of police uh, plan in the country. A black small business, most of which are retail cannot survive in this monopolizing capitalist environment unless they are protected by yeah. people power. Yeah. Yeah. Power yeah. seized by the people over resources. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Power to keep the Starbucks out of the community mm -hmm. uh, and, and power uh, to provide the necessary capital for, yeah. the, for, these, uh, for these businesses. Absolutely. No, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's something we should be developed, we should be uh, the, the the line should be designed and and really uh, because if not, there's no way it can be done. It, if it's not structural, it's it's going to be very complicated. But you see, that opens up a whole democracy issue because folks are going to be talking about where are our community development funds going. That should be something that is for the whole community to talk about. And you'll you'll find from that conversation that all kinds of projects that are not just profit making. Uh, come out of that. Uh, Non-profit making projects that actually augment profit making businesses and, mm -hmm. and 
create jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all, all subject to the will of the community. That's, uh -huh. where, that's where the organizers are uh, turning out their vote. I want to ask one, thank you so much for that. I want to put in one question and just kind of really break it down. Are we, are we inside of fascism and can we be victorious in this moment? And I ask that for all of the people watching because people, the con many people are in a lot of different places. People like the world's turning upside down. Oh my God, what's going on? Wow, this is the best. I speak to the folks in their 90s and 80s and they're like, this is an amazing moment in time because they're seeing things they've never seen before. VJ, you said, well, if you turn the statues down, that's one thing, but we need more than that. Like, what, what are we inside of and can we be, be victorious through it? Um, well, we have to be victorious because the choice is very ugly. Um, half the world's population, because of this coronavirus recession, half the world's population is unemployed and having a hard time finding food. Uh, just think about that. These are UN numbers. These are not speculations. The United Nations says half the people of the world can't find a job right now and half the people of the world are hungry. This is an unprecedented set of numbers. We have to find a solution out of this. The kind of neo-fascist clowns that we have, the, the Trumps, um, you know, the Bolsonaros, the Modis and so on, they don't have an answer. I just, I just want to leave you with my contribution with M.S. Cesar, one of the greatest communist poets and, and politicians of the 20th century. In 1950, M.S. Cesar wrote a line which stays with me and now more than ever. He said, a system that cannot solve the problems it creates is a decadent system. A system that cannot solve the problems it creates is a decadent system. This capitalist system that we have, it's a decadent system. It has created the problems of unemployment. It's created the problems of hunger. It has no solution to these problems. Therefore, it is decadent. You don't want to pin your, uh, your wagon to a decadent system. We need to be bold. We need to demand more. Our movements need to break out of the chains of feeling that they need to be realistic. We don't need to be realistic. We don't need to be normal. We need to be out of the box. We need to reach for the stars and hold them. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Chibona, you're closing, your two minutes closing. <laughs> oh, my two minutes closing. Yeah. Um, I, first, I'm honored to be on a panel with, with all of you. And I think that this new movement is demanding more and it is getting more, but it, it's not enough. I. I absolutely agree that we need to strive for more. We need to push the envelope because if we look back and take, oh, some paintings of murals on the street or some monuments coming down, we have failed the generations before us and the generations to come. We need to demand from this country. We need to demand from the system everything that is old. Us. We need to take it and run with it. We need a new democracy. We need a country and a system that works for all people. What our founding document says, we need a government that is truly for and by the people. So I would encourage young people to keep the unrest going, to keep protesting, to get to the streets, um, to our ancestors, to the older, wiser people. Please keep imparting knowledge on us. We don't want to fail. We don't want to make the mistakes of the past. We need you. Now is the time not only to unite people, but to unite people of all ages so we can come together and truly beat this fascist system. We need to overcome it. Or what's left? As we approach the fourth industrial revolution, as people are already hungry and starving, and with automation, it's only going to get worse. If we don't solve this problem, there's going to be nothing less left of us as a nation. It's going to be the really wealthy and the really poor. And we know people who look like me are going to be at the very bottom. And if we have any humanity in us, we just have to continue to fight for the greater good. Thanks, Shivana. Your, your, your two minutes closing. And then, um, Glenn, you want to close? Your, sure. your, 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 um, yeah, this late stage uh, capitalism is suffering many crises, overlapping crises, crises bumping into each other. It's so late a stage, uh, but it's also suffering a crisis of legitimacy. And, and I think that crisis of legitimacy 
uh, <clears throat> was very important uh, to the past month's uh, events. That, that is, this is a regime that cannot even protect its population from a contagious uh, disease. And on top of that, black folks, of course, die in disproportionate numbers, uh, highlighting the racist nature of this incompetent regime. I, I, I think this is extremely important uh, because when, when, as in the, uh, the old tale, when one sees that the emperor has no clothes, uh, that he's naked, uh, yeah. well, his subjects act differently. Uh, and in this kind of sense, uh, this regime, this, this dictatorship of capital, which is what we're under, uh, showed itself to be naked and left the people naked uh, to this disease, which is now, uh, we have no idea how high the death toll is going uh, to come. But one thing has been proven, and that is that this regime is dysfunctional. It is not competent. If anything invites revolt, it's not cruelty, because we all see cruelty from the state. Uh, it's incompetence from the state. And that sets all, all kinds of other classes uh, besides the folk who get treated most cruelly, we're talking about black folks, sets them in motion. And so we saw uh, with uh, these, this latest wave of demonstrations, a huge number of young white people. I think that that is directly related uh, to uh, what befell many of them, uh, many of their hero, Bernie Sanders. Uh, that millions of young people uh, believe that there was uh, a chance to make transformation uh, of, of the society through the ballot. And they learned differently when the Democratic Party and its corporate allies uh, all ganged up uh, on Bernie Sanders, mild socialist that he is. And when Bernie Sanders dropped out, I think that those expectations uh, were dashed and those young folks went to the streets. Uh, this is an indication again of, of the uh, crisis of legitimacy. Uh, the system is not legitimate for those tens of millions of Bernie supporters uh, because it quite clearly, unfairly, ganged up to crush a, de a democratic aspiration. Uh, so I, the, the system is on the ropes politically. We understand its problems in terms of its economic contradictions, uh, but there is no political crisis unless the people stand up, no matter how badly the system is functioning. And yes. we see, we, we have good reason to believe that much, many more folks than before are ready to stand up. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for all of you for coming yes. to the show. Um, we're going to, we're going to close. I just want to, to uh, uh, convene my uh, uh, support to everybody who has been uh, fighting for this yesterday, the day before, and who's going to keep fighting for, for, for this uh, struggle. Uh, really, we, uh, we have a direction, we can uh, uh, humanize the world, we can create a universal human nation, we can ask people to go on the street, I can ask my friend the white people to uh, to keep uh, str the struggle, to keep the fight, and to keep on the street, and really help to uh, transform the society we yeah. have in front of us. This yeah. is a party of the lifetime. Thank yes. you so much, everyone. And Gabby? I want to give a shout out to all of the artists out there on the grounds, just keeping the inspiration going, like Mara Sephora from Decolonize This Place, putting out her new music, Masuko Chipembere. Um, music Revolution PSA is going to be a labor of love, for, not for capital, as a place for musicians to come and express what they need to express. So look out for it. And just thank you, each and every single one of you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.